last week we talked about Joshua and how Joshua uh, had the walls. They conquered Jericho. The walls came down. And when those walls came down, there was no doubt in the mind of Joshua, his army, or anyone having to live in the city of Jericho, that there was something much bigger than just themselves going on. And when they took the, the, uh, the city of Jericho, what led the way? What went first with Joshua's army? The ark. The Ark of the Covenant went first. And the Ark is something super important that we kind of forget about, but it's it's very important. So what was in the Ark of the Covenant? They had the manna, they had the Ten Commandments, and then they had Aaron's staff. More importantly, God's people saw the Ark of the Covenant as the presence of God among them. When the Ark was with them, they had God. And so they're in the Promised Land. And Joshua's like, guys, all y'all need to decide where your hearts are because if your heart isn't with God, don't bother going any farther with us. And God fought for you. He brought you here. We have two tasks to do. We got two jobs. And one is to love God and follow God. Number two is this land that God promised us. We need to get out anybody that is not with God. Anybody that doesn't believe in God as we do, needs to leave. And now God didn't have them get people out because God wanted war, because God loved the battle scenes in the Bible, because he wanted people murdering and pillaging. That is not what's going on here. God needed the people out of the land that didn't believe in him because he knew that the Hebrews, God knew that his people could not withstand any challenges to their faith. Faith. They needed to get comfortable in their faith before they could get a challenge because if they challenged, they weren't going to be strong enough. They're not strong enough to take that on. So we got two jobs, love God, follow God, and then get everybody else out. And did they do that? Absolutely not. So they got comfortable. And evicting people is a lot of work. And when you go up to somebody that lives in a land and said, um, hi, excuse me, God told me that this land was mine and you need to get out it tends not to go very well. Eviction is hard work. So they just, some of the people they got out and most of the people they let stay because it was easier. But they've got their land, they're there, they're in the promised land. And each tribe gets an allotment of land. All the tribes except for Levi. Why Levi? The tribe of Levi were priests. Their job was to direct worship. Their job was to take care of the ark. Their job was to keep people in the know about God. They worked for God. Their job was not of this world. So the other 11 tribes would give the tribe of Levi like food, money, things like that to support, to support them because their God, their job was God. And um, so instead of... Levi getting the land, the land that would have gone to Levi goes to two of Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So they're in the promised land. The, this is the land that God said was theirs. And they have like not just a claim to this land, they have a holy claim to this land. And there's no separation of church and state. They have judges. The judges answer to God. The judges are in charge. They whine. So they get a king. They get Saul. They get David. And David is where it's at. David is this good looking guy. He is a warrior. He, he, he gets Jerusalem. He makes that the capital. So now they're not just a kingdom. Like they are a nation. They have well-defined borders. They have a great army. They have a respected king. They've got this city of Jerusalem as their capital. And David brings the ark into Jerusalem. Remember the ark. The ark is is the presence of God among them. So the ark is in a tent in Jerusalem. And David dies, and then Solomon becomes king. And Solomon builds a temple for the ark. And imagine this, this is like 1000 BC, and he builds the temple on in Jerusalem where Mount Moriah um, and the Temple Mount are now. And Solomon builds this temple and it is amazing. Think of it as like the Taj Mahal. It's got cedar wood lining the walls. It's got ivory accessories. It's got gold plated flowers. It is amazing. But most importantly, the ark is in there. The presence of God is in this temple. 
And the presence of God is in the part of the temple called the Holy of Holies. And it's separated by a curtain. And only a very specific line of priests can go in there. And only then like once a year. And the lives of God's people, the lives of the Jews, revolve around the temple. It revolves around God's presence. The temple is their center of life. It is their center of being. And you cannot be a good follower of God if you don't have, if you're not involved in the temple. We've got 12 tribes. They're in one really strong kingdom. They're a good nation. They've got defined borders, international respect, wicked smart king. They're rich. They've got a good army. They got this capital with this amazing temple that, oh, by the way, God is in. So like, what can go wrong? Then Solomon kicks the bucket. It might have been one of his 700 wives that did him in. Who knows? But his son, Rehoboam, becomes king. Now, Rehoboam, remember how the Israelites weren't really supposed to marry out? Rehoboam's mom was an Ammonite. So, and she had Ammonite beliefs, didn't, didn't believe in one God. And when Rehoboam came to the throne, instead of asking God what the best thing is to do, Rehoboam asked his friends what the best thing is to do. And they're like, bruh, like you need to totally give them like crazy taxes, super strict rules. It's going to be awesome. Go for it. And you can imagine how that went over. Um, there's trouble brewing. The, the people, especially the people in the land north of Jerusalem, they don't feel like they're being represented. They don't feel like the king is hearing them. They can't relate with their rulers. There's a huge wealth and gap. The king is living in the lap of luxury and they can barely like get by because they're sending all their money to support the king's lavish lifestyle and things are not going well. So from here on out, the 10 tribes of the north are gonna be called different names. So like my son, one of my son's name is, uh, one of my son's name is Nathaniel. But depending on who we're with and what the situation is, I might call him Nathaniel, I might call him Nate, I might call him Tater, I might call him Bubba. It just depends. And this is what happens with the North. You're from here on in, you're going to hear the North referred to as Ephraim, Manasseh, Israel, or Samaria. Remember that. That's important. And this is about 975 BC. So up North, the people are mad. They don't like the new king. They're not being treated well. They don't have enough money because their taxes are out of control. And there's this guy named Jeroboam in the north. And he's kind of a de facto leader. And he goes down south to Rehoboam. And he's like, dude, can you please just lower taxes? This is ridiculous. There's trouble brewing. And if you just listen to us, it's going to be okay. And Rehoboam's like, go away. I want nothing to do with you. I'm not lowering your taxes. Goodbye. So the north is like, we're out of here. We're done. I don't want anything to do with you. We secede. We are not part of your country anymore. So Ephraim, Manasseh, Israel, Samaria, they secede. They're not part of the kingdom anymore. And all we have left are these two little tiny tribes in the south, uh, uh, Benjamin and Judah. And remember what we talked about? Like their lives were literally revolving around the temple. Where's the temple? Jerusalem, what's in the temple, the ark, the presence of God. And at this point, a lot of the Levites, a lot of the priests leave the north to go to the south. Um, so this is what's in the south. We've got Benjamin, Judah, and the Levites, some of the Levites, and then the north is everybody else. So in the north, they don't have Levites. They don't have people to direct or worship. They don't have a temple to worship in. They don't have an ark with the presence of God. And Jeroboam solves that problem. He's like, hey, they have one temple. I'm going to one-up you. I'm going to give you two temples. I'm going to build one in Bethel. I'm going to build one in Dan. And we're going to put these golden calves in them. And we're going to write the name of Yahweh on the calf. And it's going to be awesome. Right? Right. Because the golden calf thing has always done well for us before. And since he doesn't have enough priests, Jeroboam's like, oh, uh, all you guys, guess what? You direct worship. You be priests. They weren't educated. They didn't know how to be priests. So you've got people that don't know what they're doing, leading the people in worship, worshiping a golden calf. And Samaria is also full of people that have faith that's different than the faith in the one God. So they're surrounded by people that believe different things. So to cover themselves, they have elements of God 
worship, but they also have elements of worshiping Baal and Ammonite gods and like everything else. So they just kind of mix the religion all together. And it comes down to this. Their belief, God's people's belief in the one true God uh, defined their lives. Their belief was so different than everyone else. It dictated who they were, what they wore, how they looked, where they lived, who they associated with, what their jobs were. It defined everything. The belief in God gave them their identity as a community, as a people, and as a nation. And it made them who they were. And in Samaria, when you took that away, um, they were not who God was calling them to be. They weren't who they were supposed to be. They were everything else. Everything they stood for was gone. Everything that made them who they were, that worship of God, was gone. They didn't have direction. They're not a great nation anymore. They don't have the capital. They don't have the army. They don't have Jerusalem. They don't have the ark. They don't have a great king. Their monarchy is actually like the hottest of messes. In 150 years, they have like 19 kings from nine different dynasties, and most of them die of some kind of assassination type illness. Like, it's a rough go. Judah wants nothing to do with the North at this time because the North aren't worshiping God the way they need to. Um, and they don't talk to them. They don't associate them. They don't go there. The, the North is awful. They, they don't have anything to do with them. And for a long time, when I would read the Bible, I'd be like, great, this is great, this is fine. Um, it's great to know this. This is a great story, but it's not my story. And then one day it occurred to me, as I was listening to the news, they were talking about fighting in Israel, the country of Israel right now, um, fighting land. And I'm like, wait, you are telling me that 4,000 years ago, there was a guy, Abraham, that had Isaac that had twins and Jacob had 12 kids and the land was given to those 12 tribes, those 12 kids. And this was 4,000 years ago and they're still fighting over this today. Are you kidding me? And Israel just became a country on May 14th, 1946. Like this just happened. This is still going on today. And I need to know more about this. There's something more here. And I, and after digging around, I came to the only, con the, the only conclusion I could come to was that the only reason that there's an Israel today, there's, is because of God. There are, there's no Samaria, there's no Assyria, there's no Babylonia, there's no Persia, there's no any of these other countries, but there's an Israel and it happened very recently. And then at the same time, um, I found out a lot about archaeological digs that are happening that support what's in the Bible. And if you want to geek out over that, I would love to have you geek out over that with me later because that's so much fun. And um, then I ended up moving to a Jewish neighborhood and I ended up working in a Jewish hospital. And I worked with people who were Holocaust survivors. And one woman in particular was from Austria. She was one of nine siblings and uh, she was 15 years old when she was sent to Auschwitz. And only she and her sister survived Auschwitz. Everyone else in her family was killed except for her twin brother, which she wouldn't find for another 25 years after the war ended. And every bad thing that ever happened her, to her, everything in her life happened to her because she was Jewish, because of her belief in this God. And I asked her, I'm like, Ibby, all these awful things happened to you. Why are you still Jewish? Why do you still believe? Like, I, I can't understand. And she looked at me and she goes, because of God. And it never occurred to her to stop believing because her belief in God defined her being in spite of everything that happened to her because of God. God, her belief defined her. And with my background in science, I had a really hard time accepting that the Bible wasn't anything but a book of fables. And when I saw archaeological evidence that I couldn't, that couldn't point to anything else, and I realized what, hap what happened in the Bible, we're still playing out today. And when I met people that despite awful things happening to them, their belief in God, they never gave up their faith, that's when things really started to change for me. And that's when the little crack opened in my heart and, and, and I was able to open up enough to let God in 
and it really it really changed me it changed everything about who i am so i encourage you to just do a, this may seem like a weird stuff to learn about but i encourage you to do a little bit of digging and you may be amazed at what you can find and it may really change you forever